too much. <clears throat> it's nice to be at uh, Purdue again. I graduated here almost, wow, 1981. That's almost 20 years ago. Are you sure you can hear me okay? Even in the very back? Because oh, I'm not you know, speaking very loudly. I usually have to shout during these things. <clears throat> well, besides, we have to tie this up in about an hour and a half. The University of Kansas is playing St. John's tonight. So I have to... <laughs> oh, is this a football game weekend? Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, something to watch tomorrow. Okay, that's why I chose this weekend, really, to come here. <laughs> All right. Well, um, today, I am, or tonight, I am hoping to present uh, an atheist's interpretation of the Quran. I know it sounds strange, but um, it is true, because the first time I read the Quran, I was an atheist. And so I'm going to try to recollect and to recreate, as best I can, that experience of reading the Quran as an atheist. It's, um, you know, sometimes I regret that I am not like most of you, that I am not have been born into the Muslim tradition, born into a Muslim family. I think that makes life so much easier for Muslim young people and even Muslim old people, such as myself. <clears throat> um, and, you know, you have a great history and tradition and you know so much about the religion when you, before you even realize it, before you even pick up the Quran for the first time, so much of how you read the Quran and understand the Quran has been influenced by your upbringing. The first time I picked up the Quran, I wasn't even quite sure what it was. It was a gift from a friend, and I just picked it up. I, I knew it was their holy scripture, but I really wasn't even quite sure who it was revealed through, who the author was, really almost nothing. So my perspective is sort of a, an innocent perspective. And so when I talk about it tonight, and I think it's a valuable perspective, or at least it should be a perspective that's of interest. Because I think when somebody new comes to the faith and reads the Quran and gains a different perspective, that may help us all enrich all of our perspectives. Just as much as I've benefited from listening to Muslims, born Muslims, talk about their perspective on this religion, I hope I could contribute something to that dialogue. Uh, I'm going to be talking a little bit about the purpose of life, because I was an atheist before I became a Muslim. Actually, that's all I'm going to talk about tonight. What? Because that was my main problem when I picked up the Quran. I wanted to know what it had to say about the purpose of life. I wasn't expecting much, but it was an interesting journey nonetheless. And so that's what I'll be talking about tonight. My uh, mom never got to come to Purdue University. My mom saw me lecture at several universities around this uh, nation. Uh, she saw me lecture several times about Islam. And she was one of my uh, best audiences, one of the best people I've ever had in an audience. She used to sit up front, and I could see in her eyes not just uh, interest, but also uh, a certain amount of pride. She was a very devout Christian, and she uh, uh, was that till her uh, dying day, the day she died. But I really, really was loved having my mom in the audience. And I always miss her, even now. I don't give, really give that many lectures even though I hear that you guys have some tapes of mine from old. I don't really give that many lectures, but whenever I am in study, standing in front of an audience and I look at that front row, I still miss the absence of my mother there. <clears throat> and I wish you could have met, met her, because she was really a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful mother and person. And I'm not just saying that because she's my mother, but so many people knew, that knew her said the same. I remember when my mom died, a few years ago, and I was at her funeral. Pers it was one of the biggest funerals I've ever seen. And person after person who came up to me to express their condolences, expressed it in almost exactly the same way every time. They said, Jeff, your mom it was a true saint. And, and they would walk up to me, and it would seem like they had prepared this. Every person that would come up would say, yes, Jeff, your mom was such a great lady. She was a true saint. Even my ex-wife who was an atheist, my first wife. We were married a few years and we got divorced while we were PhD students at Purdue. But she came up to me and she told me this very same thing. She said, Jeff, you know, you're, I don't believe in God, but you know, I still think your mother was a true saint. 
Um, for a long time in my life, my mom was the only person I was really able to love. Uh, she was uh, my closest friend. She was my protector. She was my only real hero. She was a deeply religious Catholic. She was a dedicated nurse. She was loved by all our neighbors. And she was the most giving and charitable person I ever know, I've ever known. She was truly a very religious, devout woman. She didn't wear it on her sleeve. She expressed it through her treatment of others, her behavior towards others. I remember, I could still see my mom visiting the old Italian lady next door, Mrs. Caltabiano. She was in her 70s. I remember this lady, every, all the kids in the neighborhood hated her. She was, uh, had extremely bad temper. But my mother would visit her once a month and go over there with a basin of water and a towel over her shoulder, and she would trim that lady, old lady's feet, the, the toenails on her feet, and wash her feet uh, once a month. And I remember saying to her, Mom, why do you do that? I mean, that lady is so mean, she's so old, she has such stinky feet, why would you go over and wash her feet? And I remember once she said to me, Son, if Jesus could wash the feet of others, so can I. And that's what kind of religiosity she had. She translated her religiosity into helping others. And to her, that was what life was all about. Life was about giving. I remember how much compassion she had for her patients at the hospital, and how warmly they spoke about her when I would come to pick her up from work late at night, because she worked sort of the graveyard trip, uh, shift. So I'd pick her up very late at night. And her patients used to stop me while I was walking out the hall to pull me aside and brag about my mother for usually too long. I remember what great mother she, and teacher she was. I remember how honest she was. And how she never swore or treated anyone rudely. Uh, my mom wasn't perfect. She, she used to gossip a little, but she was the nearest thing to perfection I ever knew. Most of all, I remember how, she loved, how much she loved her five sons. And how hard she worked to provide them with as normal and a happy life as possible. Despite the handicap we acquired. And the handicap that we acquired, I'm sad to say, and I even hate to bring it up, but it's central to this lecture, was my father. I don't know what was the matter with my father or how he became the way he was, but my father had this deep inner rage and anger that he just really couldn't control. And every night, he would try to numb that rage and that anger with hard, hard, drinking. And he usually wasn't very successful. His drinking made my father all the more volatile because he could be laughing and joking one minute and he could fly into an angry rampage the next and he, once he erupted there was just no stopping him. It was like a thunderstorm, the severe thunderstorm that comes in over the horizon and starts exploding above you and that just wouldn't go away. And he would be like that all night long for several hours and it would take a ton of time and a ton of hard liquor before it would finally put him to rest. And it was really terrible. Living with my father was like carrying a box of nitroglycerin. You just weren't sure what was going to set it off. The slightest agitation, the slightest shift, he could unexpectedly explode into his violence. And it was, it was not easy. It was not easy at all. <clears throat> My four brothers and I had a frightful and uncertain childhood, but the worst of it, the worst of it, which is watching my father regularly taunt, threaten, and abuse my mother. When I was a little boy, I used to daydream about life without my father. It was my almost constant wish and daydream. I just wanted the violence to go away. I wanted not to be afraid anymore. I felt like I was trapped in a bad dream and there just was no way out. So I prayed and again and again to God to remove my father from our lives and to stop the pain. But my father was always there and very early on I began to wonder if God really was. I could not fathom why God would sentence my mom to lifelong punishment. I could not imagine what great sin she must have committed or that we, her children, must have committed to deserve my father. I lacked the maturity to sort out those questions, but I certainly had enough anger and fear inside me to provoke them. 
I was too young to see the wisdom in allowing my mother and her children to suffer the violence and abuse of my father. I was too young to understand what God would let innocent children lie in bed every night, crying, wondering, hoping, praying that their mom will still be in one piece the next morning. I just couldn't see why God would let that, let that be. I could not understand how God and his mercy and forgiveness could extend that mercy and forgiveness to someone like my father with all his terrible failings. All I can see in my world was chaos and violence. and so. When I became old enough to think for myself, it became easy for me to question the existence of God. We also lived in a very violent city. The, the violence outside was nothing compared to the violence inside. But the violence that was happening in the world around me only confirmed what my father already had taught me only too well. There were the assassinations of the Kennedys when I was a kid, and Martin Luther King. There were race riots in cities like mine, and burnings and lootings. There were even people burned alive in the streets. Firemen used to come to, to places where liars, fires were purposely lit, and snipers used to be picking them off. Gang fights were rampant in my neighborhood. It seemed like we had one every couple of months. Sometimes kids would get shot. Most of the time, there was always several that were extremely badly injured, taken to the hospital. The police would show up after it was over so they wouldn't get hurt and take the bodies away, take the kids to the hospital. And of course, we also had the Vietnam War going on that time, that senseless war. And we'd see the night after night on a television screen, young American boys being put in body bags, taken back to our country. And even worse, we'd see the Vietnamese civilians, and especially the children, being slaughtered at our own hands and kids running down the street, Vietnamese children running down the street after bombing, some of them naked, some of them on fire, from napalm burning all over them. All that, all the violence in the world confirmed for me the lesson that I, was already ingrained in me, that this world is dominated by random, consuming, undiscriminating violence. And very early on, I began to ask why, and that, from a very early age. But that question became more intense for me as I got older and older. As I reached my late teenage years, I wondered why it had to be this way. Why did it have to be this way? I have three daughters. Not too long ago, I was walking with my wife, walking along, and two of my daughters were walking with me, and the youngest one, Fatten, was, whose name means alluring. You know, Fatten, my youngest daughter, my 10-year-old, was riding ahead of us on her bike. Then she circled around and rode by us again, going full speed. And as she was riding by, she said, I am Fatten Lang, and I love being me. I looked at my wife and I said, we must be doing something right, you know. And I was walking with my daughter, Sarah, not just long, long ago, because she's trying to lose a little weight. So she walks with me. I'm a, I walk several miles every day, but now I come home after work and I walk an hour with her at night. And she's, you know, she's trimming down. She wants to lose a little weight. But I'm walking along and she says, Daddy, I know I have to lose a, weight, a little weight, but I know I am beautiful. You know? And that's because she feels it inside. You know? I mean, she, when she says such a statement like that, or my other daughter says, I love being me, and they tell me, Daddy, I think I'm beautiful, they feel that deeply inside. Something inside, it's not something, it glows from within. My wife is about 35 pounds overweight. And please don't record this. You can erase that from the table. <laughs> She'll kill me, please. <laughs> but she's about 35 pounds overweight, and she's 40 years old now. I got her age right. She'll kill me for that as well. But she's 40, about 35 pounds overweight. But not, but not too long ago, she said to me, you know, and said to all of us, hey, look, my daughters were giving her a hard time about her weight. She said, I don't care, I know I'm beautiful. Because she's always felt that way. That's not so much an appraisal of how a person sees themselves physically, it's how they see themselves in their totality. Well, when I look at myself to this day, when I think about myself, the last word I would ever use to characterize myself is beautiful or handsome or attractive. 
Because after I, growing up in that environment, becoming an adult, somewhere early in my life, etched upon my being, I came to see myself in a very different way. And to this day, when I'm walking along and I'm thinking about how I look to others, or I just think about myself, I just see someone scarred, odd, disfigured. And I'll think about that. That's the way I'll probably perceive myself to the day I die. And I don't think we realize how much we affect our children and the way they see themselves. But it was amazing to me that there could be a God and God could let that type of thing happen to children. My four brothers ended up following the same road of self-destruction that my father followed. They went down the same way. All four of them became drug addicts. One just recently died of alcoholism. Two just recently kicked their habits after they had had them for 25 years. Another one was a heroin addict. He had to be jailed before he could finally kick his habit. I mean, why would God put people at such a disadvantage? This bothered me. Why did God create such an imperfect and violent world, I wondered. Why didn't he just put us into heaven in first, in the, from the very first and keep us there and keep us there? Why did he make us so criminally inclined, so corruptible, so rebellious and destructive and self-destructive? I mean, why would he do that, I thought. Couldn't he make a more perfect creature? Couldn't he just make us angels? I mean, if there exists angels, and I was taught, and I grew up in a Catholic faith that there is, why couldn't he make us like that? Why did he make us worse than they? If he could create better, what, did he just slip up? It got out of his control? I was told that he was omnipotent. How could that happen? If he wants us to submit to his will, why didn't he just make us submit to his will from the beginning? It's that simple. Why didn't he make us angels if he has it within his power? Why does he let the strong torture and oppress the weak? Why does he let blameless children be scarred so deeply and indelibly by the violence of their childhood? And many, and trust me, I'm not feeling sorry for myself. There's tons of kids, tons of kids that suffer much worse than I did when I was a child. I wanted to know why. And I demanded an answer. And I didn't care where that answer came from. I tell you the truth, I didn't care if that answer came from heaven or if it came from hell. I didn't care if it came from an angel or the devil himself. I didn't care if it came from the Pope or Charles Manson. I just wanted an answer, and I just wanted to know the truth. <clears throat> I used to argue with my mother when I became an atheist at 16. Not argue, my mom didn't argue. Somehow she <laughs> had this strange confidence that someday I would believe in God again. I used to ask her, what makes you think that, mom? <laughs> and as usual, she would pull out one of her old sayings she learned from her grandmother. As my grandmother always said, Jeff, the way the twig is bent, the tree will grow. <laughs> I used to shake my head and think, wow, my mom, she's Don Quixote. You know, this is living an illusion. <clears throat> I told her I had three main problems with religion. Number one, why would God give us reason if our reason conflicts with faith? See, when we think about God and start asking questions about God, it naturally leads to impossible questions, irreconcilable issues. The dogmas that we're taught to believe in just don't make sense, I told her. Why would God create us to believe in these things if they go against reason? Or in the first place, why give us reason anyway? If reason leads to these contradictions, it makes it hard for us to believe in God. Why does he give us choice, the ability to choose? Just make us perfect. Why does he allow us to choose to become evil? Just didn't make sense, I said to her, if he wants us to submit to his will. And most of all, why does he allow us to suffer? Couldn't he, we have bypassed the suffering? Popped us into heaven from the first? In any case, I became an avowed atheist when I was in my middle teenage years. I can't remember now exactly when, 17, 18, something like that. 
No, I guess it was 16, 16 years old. I remember a religion class where I declared it to the class. <laughs> but that's it. I could not see what is the possible purpose of life. And I never found that out, so I guess I'll see you next time. <laughs> it's good talking to you. Good night. Good night. <laughs> Got to go catch a basketball game. No. <clears throat> no. Uh, I was an atheist for about 12 years. I. That's not. Doesn't mean I wasn't ever. I became uninterested in religion. I was always fascinated by religion. You know how. Ex-alcoholics are fascinated about studies about alcoholism and they become, you know, obsessed with studying alcoholism or, you know, you notice how psychiatrists are usually sort of crazy themselves, you know. <laughs> well, it's true. I mean, most psychiatrists, wow. But, you know, most people that have been injured or harmed by something, become, it becomes their obsession. So I was always fascinated by religion. You know, and when I, at Purdue University, especially when I was here, there were so many different cultures, so many different religious perspectives. I was in heaven, or my own kind of heaven, you know. I would uh, talk to kids on campus about their different religious beliefs. There was a Muslim lady in our, I remember on, I was right in this building over here, the uh, tall one with the, that you could walk underneath. <laughs> What's the name of it? The Math Science Center or something? Yeah, I was right over here, and there was a lady on my floor. I think it was the seventh floor. She was a Muslim lady, I don't know where from, dressed in black and everything, and I saw her walking down the hall one day. Sure enough, she came in and started asking me for some help in some mathematics problems. Professor Perlis, I don't know if he's still here, sent her to me because I was pretty good in uh, commutative algebra. So she came and I was helping her and things like that. And in the process, I began asking her questions about her religion and you know, we started to develop this friendship and everything and then she refused to see me. <laughs> but, <laughs> <laughs> but, but I was, you know, that almost killed me. I went, what, what's going on here? But I was fascinated by uh, different people's religious perspective, perspectives. Not that I was searching. You know, usually when I talk to people, I became ever more confirmed of my disbelief in God. But it's, it fascinated me. Uh, when I graduated here and went to San Francisco, I met some more uh, Muslims and other faith, people of other faiths as well. But I really became very close with one Muslim family in particular. And one time they gave me uh, the Quran as a gift. After I badgered them with my questions long enough, they, they just sort of got fed up with me, I think. And they, and they gave me a copy of the Quran. And at first I thought, what? Do they want to convert me? I mean, what's going on here? <laughs> But then I realized that it was an innocent enough gesture. I had been asking them a lot of questions, and they apparently thought that they were not up to my questions, and maybe, as a matter of fact, eventually they explicitly told me that maybe I could find better answers here as, to, as far as what their faith represents concerning the questions I was asking them, the usual questions. Why does God let us suffer? Why doesn't he just pop us into heaven, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. <clears throat> Well, about four or five days after they gave it to me, I had run out of reading material just by coincidence. And I had nothing to read that night. And I had no television in my apartment in San Francisco. And so I uh, looked to my left. I remember sitting on my couch. And on the table next to me, the end table, was the copy of the Quran. And so I thought, oh, well, I'll pick it up and read it. And so I did. And I began to read it. And I found it in a very intriguing book. And I picked it up, and I read the first seven verses, which are essentially a prayer for guidance. You know, it sort of teaches you a prayer for guidance. Uh, in the name of God, the most merciful, compassionate, uh, creator of, uh, ruler of all worlds, master of the day of judgment, to you alone we uh, seek, to you alone we pray, and you alone we seek, show us a straight path, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You know, I thought, oh, prayer, fitting way to begin a book. And then I turned to the next surah, or I'll use chapter. I'll call it a chapter for now. I turned to the next chapter of the Quran. And then it begins, and it says, that is the book. It begins, alif, lam, mim. Let me skip that right now. There are three Arabic symbols, letters. Alif, lam, mim. That is the book. We're in no doubt is guidance. Now, of course, I just realized I had just prayed for guidance. 
or unknowingly, you know, not intentionally. And then I read this next line and it says, that is the book we're in no doubt is the guidance, is the guidance. And I'm looking at the book and I'm thinking to myself, you know, you mean this is the answer to this prayer I just said? And I look at the, what it says in front of me and it says, that is the book. Uh, and look up to my, thinking to myself, this is the book, that is the book. <laughs> and it startled me, you know, because from that point on, the entire Quran addresses the reader as if it's God addressing the person reading the book, speaking to him directly. I thought, what an ingenious author this is. He writes a revelation, and instead of talking about a history or even a biography, it's a personal address from God to the reader. I thought, it's like the Ten Commandments, even more personal than that, expanded to textual form, you know, to a long text. I thought, what a clever genius this author was. You know, it's supposed to be a revelation from God. You read it, it's God talking to the reader. <clears throat> As I read on, I became more impressed with the author. And at that point, I really didn't even know who was, who even people who didn't believe in Islam claimed to be the author. Although I certainly began asking right as, as soon as possible and starting to read about this religion and its scripture as, and as I was reading through the Quran, I really became obsessed by it and really just threw myself into studying this. And this, it amazed me because it would constantly sort of talk to you personally. And it would include intriguing things that really caught my interest. Like, I remember reading the verse, I think it's the 25th verse of that second chapter. I'm hardly into the Quran. And I come up to the 25th verse, and it, says, it gives this very sort of concrete description of paradise, of heaven in the hereafter. And it talks about rivers running underneath and, you know, beautiful shade and things like that. And, and I'm thinking, oh, come on, this is too too concrete. I could see how this would appeal to 7th century Arabian mentality, but, you know, if a guy was from Alaska and he was reading this, you know, he would like warm sandy beaches than cool shade, you know, and he would like, you know, bikini-clad supermodels <laughs> than, you know, whatever, you know, to what the Quran described. <clears throat> But then I go to the right, and I just, you know, and I'm starting to think to myself, oh, this author wasn't so clever. And I go to the next verse, and it says, and God does not disdain from using any kind of parable, even if it is of a gnat, to get his point across. See, I just read this verse that I took very concretely, and the next one says, oh, don't take every statement in this, you know, in the Quran so concretely. You know, it says, God does not disdain to use a parable a symbolic statement to get his point across. I thought, man, this guy who wrote this Quran is brilliant. You know, he sort of addresses people on one level, and then he knows that there's going to be more, you know, sneakier, trickier people reading it, and so he catches them in the next verse and says, hey, you, you kind of skeptical person, I mean, don't think, you know, God does not disdain to cite parables in order to get it, you know, in order to catch your imagination, even if it is of a gnat, you know. I thought, brilliant. The first 29 verses of that second chapter, beginning of the Quran, sort of describe its audience. You know, there are the believers, the people who have a natural, so not natural, but who believe in God and are sincere, and it says that this Quran will be of great benefit to them. And then it talks about the people who will not benefit at all. The, dis, the people who just reject it out of hand are completely closed-minded, and the Quran dismisses them in one, one verse. Talks about them in one verse, dismisses them in one verse. They're going to not gain from this at all. And then it talks about the people on the fence, sort of in the middle, who waver between belief and disbelief. And it says how you know, they could benefit, but, it, but they have to be sincere, and they have to be open-minded, et cetera. And I'm thinking, you know, what a modern way to begin a text, you know, because it describes its audience, talks about the prerequisites to gain from this, who will gain from it, who will not. Sort of the way we write textbooks nowadays. Like if I write a math text, I say, well, this book is appropriate for freshmen and sophomores, but it's also even appropriate for seniors in high school if they have this and this background and so forth. But, for, you know, high school, you know, younger than that, students with a lesser background won't, won't be able to benefit from this. 
And I thought, oh, what a brilliant way to begin this uh, scripture. It's very modern in, in so many ways. Okay, so I was impressed by the author. That's the most important point I'm trying to make. He impressed me right from the start. <coughs> And I was more, I quickly became very intrigued by the author. I wanted to understand him better. I was in awe of what I thought was his mind, his brilliance. Then I come, naturally enough, after the introduction, to the 30th verse of the second surah. And it begins the story of man. Now, some people take that as history. I personally took it as an allegory as a symbolic story. Uh, you know, from my background, that was a natural way to read it. Especially because of internal things inside that story and from other verses in the Quran that I would later read that sort of confirm, me, confirm my belief in that. So I took it as primarily symbolic. And I was looking to read it to gain, to understand meaning. To gain some meaning about what the author had to say about the purpose of life. But regardless how you take it, I think you're going to come to more or less similar conclusions. Okay, so here I am. I turn to the story of man, and I read the 30th uh, verse of the second surah that begins that story. And I look down at it, and I read through that. Hmm, I read that one. And then the story continues up till, the, I think, the 39th uh, verse. Very short introduction. I read through it once, and it's this didn't sound right, because I was familiar with this story. You could read it in the Bible. So I read it again and again, two or three times, and I realize something is really strange here. The author seems to have missed the entire point and purpose of the story. I mean, he's permuted details. He seems to have missed the, the main point of the story. And I began to wonder if he, he, he just never quite heard it right. But on the other hand, there seemed to be something underneath the surface here that he was trying to say that seemed very intriguing. So I decided finally to go back and read it very carefully, line by line, verse by verse, and give him the benefit of the doubt. Give it a true, honest reading and see what it had to say, because it intrigued me. And I read the 30th verse of the second surah, and here's the way it goes. And it says, Behold, your Lord said to the angels, I am going to place a representative of mine on earth, a vice -trend, a representative on earth, representative of God. And they said, the angels, will you place therein one who will spread corruption and shed blood? Will we celebrate your praises and glorify your holiness? And he said, truly I know what you do not know. I looked at that verse and I just felt kind of like a ting, not more than a tingle, you know, like a, a coldness come over me. You know, I felt like somebody was in the room. And I read it again, and it says, Behold, your Lord said to the angels, I am going to place a vicegerent, a representative of mine, on earth. I thought, no, no, you got it all wrong. Because here the author is saying, Behold, your Lord said to the angels, I'm going to place man, apparently, on earth as my representative. I thought, no, that's not why you're putting man on earth. You're putting him there as a punishment. He sins, and you punish him. You didn't create him from the start to put him on earth as your representative. You put him there to punish him. But that's not what it says. Long before man, Adam, and Eve even appear on a scene, it says, I'm going to place him there on earth as my representative. I thought, no, no, that's entirely wrong. And then I read the next verse, and that one was the one that hooked me. Because then the angels say, because up to that point I thought, does he really mean what he's saying? I mean, is he really saying that he's not putting them there as a punishment, but, you know, to represent him? Is he giving him this a positive appraisal of mankind right from the start? And then, like I said, the rest of that verse goes, they said, will you place there in one who will spread corruption and shed blood? The angels are saying this. While we, the angels, celebrate your praises and glorify you? I looked at that and said, that's my question. Right? Because the angels are raising a natural objection. Will you place her in one who will spread corruption and shed blood? God just said, I'm going to put man there to represent me. And the angels naturally say, why? This creature? 
this rebellious being, this creature who spreads corruption and sheds much blood, you're going to create him and put him on earth and his progeny? While what? While we celebrate your praises and glorify your holiness? Why put this creature on earth? Why even make him in the first place when you could create us, the angels, who are perfectly submissive to your will, who do exactly what you want of us, who only glorify you and praise you? Why create this being? Why create him in the first place? Why create this being who sheds, spreads corruption and sheds much blood? It's a natural question. That's my question. The atheist question. I thought the author was trying to play with me. Play with my emotions. Manipulate the story just to agitate me. I said it right there with the angels. Yes, why create this creature when you create angels? And notice where the question is coming from. It's coming from heaven. It's being asked in heaven. Which gives the question all the more force. Because why create this creature with his criminal inclinations, then put him in an environment where he falsely feels he's distant from God and cannot even perceive him with his five senses, so he feels free, distant from God, and unleash him in that environment where he could pursue his worst criminal inclinations? just got to get you. And when I read that, I was almost furious. Yes, why? Why do that? And then the rest of that verse goes, and here's God's answer to the angel's question. Truly I know what you do not know. In modern parlance, that would be, yes, truly I know what I'm doing. I know exactly what I'm doing. You know exactly what you're doing, I said? You know exactly what you're doing? No, no, you don't get off that easily, I thought to myself. You don't take my whole question. You don't take my pain. You don't take my life. Summarize it in two verses and then just walk away and say you know what you're doing. That's my life there. That's my rage, that's my anger. You cannot walk away that easy. No, you don't ask that question without answering it. I want to know what is the answer to that question. You made me, I thought to myself. And then it dawned on me, I was arguing with a God I didn't even believe in. <clears throat> and that would happen often when I read this Quran. Every now and then I would slip into an argument with the scripture. Arguing with a divinity I didn't even believe in. Complaining to a God that I rejected. But that was the brilliance I thought of the author. The way he could phrase things in such a way to lure you in to feeling like you're conversing with God himself. I thought this author was extremely brilliant. And so I kept on reading, even though right now I was extremely agitated. But the strange thing is, the author didn't end the answer to the angel's question with that verse. He just didn't say, truly I know what you do not, and then dismiss the question. Are you guys getting tired and bored? <laughs> no, seriously. <laughs> Sorry about this, but you know, these things are kind of fun for me, but <laughs> you know, whenever I talk about these, my daughters go, oh, here he goes again. <laughs> <You know? laughs> You know, but you know, for me it's like doing mathematics. You know? <laughs> it's beautiful. Even though I know, you know, mo all students would agree with that. <laughs> but in any case, so I turn to the next verse and it says, and he, God, taught Adam the names of all things. Hmm. And then he placed them before the angels and said, tell me their names if you are right. I looked at that verse and it's clearly addressing the angel's question. It's responding to the angel's question. And it's interesting what it says. And he taught Adam the names of all things and then placed them before the angels and said, tell me their names if you are right. Right about what? About your question, your objection in a sense, to the existence of man. Hmm. I remembered that in a, the account of this story that I had known from as I was a child, that man learns 
man is taught, to, not taught, but he is, acquires the ability to name things. But it was not presented as an answer to any kind of question. But in this version, the author now took this naming incident and used it to answer, to begin an answer to the angel's question. And he taught Adams the names of all things. I realized very quickly that you have to be very close, pay very close attention to the wording because this author was extremely skillful in his choice of words. And he said, and he taught Adam the names of all things. He's emphasizing that Adam here is, can learn. He can be taught. He's an intellectual being. And he taught Adam what? How to name all things. All things. All things that come into his conscious mind. Everything he sees, everything he experiences, he's able to assign verbal symbols. Throughout, I was later discovered that throughout the Quran, the gift of human language, the human ability to, to communicate, not just in word, but also in writing, would be emphasized throughout the Quran. That this skill is what makes man way above the creature, creatures around him. This gift, especially, is one of the greatest gifts that God gives to mankind. In the Quran, in one place, it says, it, it explicitly states that, that uh, read, commands the reader. Read in the name of your Lord who created, created man from a tiny creature that clings. Read and your Lord is most bountiful. Why? Because he taught man the use of the pen, taught him with it what he could never know, what he knew not. The Quran will emphasize reading, talking, communicating, and man's intellectual abilities, especially as it is symbolized in this verse. What makes man special? What makes him unique, what begins as an answer to the angel's question, the author points to this first, men's intellectual abilities. He begins by answering the angel's question by pointing to that, men's intellect, as symbolized especially in his ability to assign verbal symbols to all the concepts that come into his mind. And then he placed them before the angels and said, you, tell me their names if you are right. And they said, glory to you. We have no knowledge except what you taught us. We only have the knowledge, the level of knowledge, the intellect that you have provided for us. We cannot do this. They do not have the intellect. They do not have the intelligence to be able to create on their own verbal symbols for what they experience. Glory be to you. We have no knowledge except what you taught us. We cannot name these things. And they say, in truth, it is you who are knowing the wise. This takes knowledge. This takes wisdom. This takes at least a certain level of genius to be able to name things like this. They admit their inferiority. This is beyond them. And then you turn to the next verse and it says, and he said, oh, Adam, tell them their names. And Adam succeeds where the angels failed. The angels could not, did not have the ability to be able to, do, to meet this task. Adam, he succeeds instantly. And when he had told them their names, God said to the angels, did I not tell you that I know what is unseen in the heavens and the earth? And I know what you reveal and what you conceal? A direct reference to the question. Did I not tell you that I know what is in the heavens and the earth, and I know what you reveal and you conceal? Didn't see? Didn't I just tell you? I know exactly what I'm doing. <clears throat> but the thing that got me was this last part. Did I not tell you that I know what is unseen in the heavens and the earth, and I know what you reveal and you conceal? What did the angels reveal? What did they conceal? I was amazed at the economy of expression of the author. In just a few words, he could pack so much meaning. It's so easy to just read through this. I read through this three times, I told you, two or three times, before I went back and read through it slowly. and didn't realize anything. Couldn't see the, get the picture. But I went back and read it line by line, word by word. Suddenly a whole world was opening up to me. Did I not tell you that I know what is unseen in the heavens and the earth, and I know what you reveal? And what you conceal, what did the angels reveal? What did they conceal? Well, I look back, it's obvious what they revealed. The evil propensities of man. 
Man's ability to destroy, to wreak havoc, to spread corruption, to shed blood, they revealed the dark side of human nature, plainly. But what did they conceal? I thought about it and it was obvious. They ignored, neglected to say, that man has a reciprocal ability to do good, to show compassion, to be kind, to be merciful, to be just, to be, do what is righteous, to do righteous deeds. Man has the ability to rise to great heights of virtue. That was an eye-opener for me. Because I had always seen the dark side of the man. That, I was blind to it. I had a blind spot. I was blind to the, uh, the reciprocal ability of man. But here, the angels are being told exactly what I needed to be told. That yes, human beings could be extremely destructive. They could be violent. They could be vicious. They could be mean. But they also could be kind, good, merciful, virtuous. And we all know it throughout history. We have the greatest exemplars of goodness and the greatest exemplars of evil, sometimes living side by side on the human stage. We have great examples, Adolf Hitler and Schindler. Usually when someone evil arises, it forces the good out of others. They seem to produce, to bring out the best in each other in a certain sense. Right? But here, that's what it was saying. Sometimes these great exemplars of both tendencies, they could live in the same era, in the same country, in the same city, even on the same block, even in the same house. And we said, Next verse, and be, oh no, and it says in the next verse, and behold, we said to the angels, bow down to Adam, and they bowed down. But not so Iblis, it turns out to be Satan. He refused and was arrogant. He was of those who reject faith. And we said to the angels, bow down to Adam. If I had any doubt up until this point that the author meant that human intelligence made mankind potentially superior to the angels, this verse removed all doubt. Because it says to the angels, after God demonstrates that man is his intellectual superior, it tells the angels, bow down to Adam. And they bow down. Bow do bowing down could be a symbol of what? Well, it could be a symbol of inferiority, but it also could be a symbol of subservience. And perhaps the author, and I would later see that this is true, that what he's saying here is that not only angels are of lesser intelligence than man, do not have his intellectual capacity, but also it's saying that these angels will serve the development, will serve God, but they will serve the development of man. And later in the Quran, we'll see that everything else about us in this learning experience, in this life on earth, is for to, to serve our growth and development. Even Satan, it turns out, serves a function according to the Quran. All of it serves an essential role in the development and evolution of the human personality. <clears throat> and Iblis refused, Satan refused to bow down. Why? Because he was arrogant. He was of those who reject faith. If you give me a minute, I'll just summarize where we are right now. Angels ask the right question. Why create this human being in the first place? Because he is so destructive and violent, and sinful, etc. God begins to answer the question by saying, look, he has superior intelligence. He has a tremendous capacity, intellectual capacity, in comparison to the other creatures around him. When he demonstrates this, he tells the angels to bow down. You will serve his development. And then he introduces Satan, Iblis. And so what does Satan, I thought, represent in almost every culture? What do angels represent in almost every culture? In almost every culture, and especially in the religion I grew up with, Satan represents the source of temptation. That, that being who whispers temptations into our soul. Angels represent the source of those magnanimous urgings. So that when we're faced with a moral dilemma, we hear both voices in our soul telling us, go ahead. You know, enjoy yourself. Don't worry about it. It's okay. Relax. You know, that would be good for you. you have a good time. The angel saying, no, that's not the right thing, Jeff. Don't do that. You do that, you're doing the wrong thing. Remember your mom. Remember how honest she was. That's what she taught you. you know? so, 
Here the author is introducing the source of temptation that we are exposed to and the source of inspiration that all human beings are subject to. That's what they pretty much represent in all cultures. But why does he introduce it at this stage? Well, first, in answer to the angel's question, I thought he's talking about man's intellectual ability. Now he's talking about what? Man has the ability to choose. To choose between, because he is subject to magnanimous urgings and evil promptings. And he has the ability, as we'll soon see, to choose between them. Man is a creature of choice, a moral being. And these promptings that he's subjected to, magnanimous urgings and evil promptings, temptations, heighten the morality of a decision. It forces us to focus on it so that not only can we discern between the two, but when we have to make a moral decision, it becomes, we focus on it in an intense, we're forced to focus on it in an intense way. So up to this point, we see that man has gone through a period of instruction, of learning. In his development, he's now become a moral being, and so he was presented with a choice. And he said, and we said, O Adam, dwell you and your spouse in the garden, and eat freely thereof what you wish. But come not near this tree, for you will be among the wrongdoers. I'm thinking, the author either has his own original version that he's talking about here, that he's presenting here, or he just can't make up his mind what point he is trying to get get across. He's getting lost. Let me read it again. Dwell you and your spouse in the garden and eat freely thereof what you wish, but come not near this tree, for you will be among the wrongdoers. The reason why I said the author seems to be confused is because he, he's almost totally dispassionate in that statement. I said to myself, no, that's not how it works. God is supposed to be fearful at the prospect that Adam may eat from the tree. Because that's the tree of eternal life and infinite knowledge. And if he eats from it, as it said in my upbringing, they will become as gods. And so God, after he banishes man from the garden, puts an angel around that tree so that he never goes near it again. For God knows if he goes near that tree, it's a disaster. Man could become his equal. And he's nervous and frightened at the prospect that man will go to the tree and eat from it. But here, there's no sense of urgency. There's no sense of panic. There's no sense of even wor mild worry. God says to Adam and Eve, O Adam, dwell you and your spouse in the garden, and eat freely thereof what you wish, but come not near this tree, for why? For you will be among the wrongdoers. It's almost as if the tree is picked at random. Uh, let's see, Adam, Eve, go not eat whatever you like in the garden, but don't go near that tree. There's nothing special about the tree. I read the whole rest of the Quran. There was nothing special about the tree. Satan tempted Adam and told him, it's, you know, this tree, if you eat this from this fruit, you'll have any great kingdom, a kingdom that never decays, and so forth and eternal life. It turns out to be a falsification on his part. No truth in it at all. But God seems totally in control here. Not at all worried at this prospect. What does the next verse say? But Satan caused them to slip and expelled them from the state in which they were. I read that verse and said, what? This author has a penchant for understating things. What happened? But Satan caused them to slip and expelled them from the state in which they were. What? The greatest sin in the history of the human race? The sin for which you and I and all of us here are sweating it out down here on earth and we have to live and and work and suffer and go through pain and agony and death that sin that brought this down upon us is a slip? A slip? I went to my Arabian friends and I asked them, you see this verse in the Quran here? This word here, could you tell me what it means? And they said, it means to slip. 
And I said to them, no. I mean, you know, a slip in English is when I go like this. <laughs> you know? A slip is a, a minor distraction. You get distracted for a second and you sort of lose your focus, but you immediately regain it. It's something minor, I told them. You know, like I say to another American, you know, I slipped up, it's no big deal. Jeff, what happened there? Oh, don't worry about it. Uh, I tell my department head, it's just a slip up, won't happen again. You know, it's a slip up, don't worry about it. Oh, I slipped, no big deal. You know, they told me it means the same thing, <laughs> it's a slip, no big deal. The slip? That Satan caused them to slip. And they were expelled from the state in which they were. What state were they? Total compliance to God's will. What state were they in now? They had discovered the ability to go against that will, to make an independent choice. Up to this point, we saw that they were given the ability to choose, presented with temptation and magnanimous urgings. Now, now, you actually see them make that independent choice. They have, might have been given many commands before, or may have had many choices before. What's significant about this choice, the story seems to be saying, is that it's the first time they made an independent one. But Satan caused them to slip and expelled them from the state in which they were. And we said, go you all down, some of you being the enemies of others, and on earth will be your dwelling place and provision for a time. Go you all down, some of you will be adversaries of others, and on earth will be your dwelling place and provision for a time. The author, I thought, he just doesn't get it. I mean, there should be rage here. There should be anger. God should be furious. He should be losing it. He should be threatening this creature. He should be screaming at him, telling him, yes, and the woman, you're going to you're gonna have a period and you're going to scream on your labor pants. And you, you, you did it. Then you're, and then he's, she, he, this, this, this guy who you were too smart and you, and you tricked him, he's going to rule over you. That's going to teach you a lesson. And, you know, and so forth. But here, he simply says, go you all down, some of you being adversaries of others, and earth will be your dwelling place and provision for a time. And that's not a God losing it. And on earth will be your dwelling place and provision for a time. When I walked into the hotel today, and the person behind the desk said, here's your room, and we have a continental breakfast in the morning, I didn't assume they were angry at me. No. 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 Here's your room, we have a continental breakfast in the morning. Oh. <gasps> you know. I didn't assume they were angry at me. They weren't. But that's essentially, go you all down, some of you will be adversaries of others. The angels already said that in their, in their question. No. There will be violence. This creature creates violence. This seems to be more warning than anything else. And on earth will be your dwelling place and provision for a time. I thought, wait a minute. Maybe I'm misreading this. The next verse, will, I'm sure, will show God exploding out of control. And then Adam received words from his Lord. And he turned to him mercifully, for truly God is oft returning, ever merciful. What? Merciful? Adam receives words from his Lord? Turns out in the next verse, the words of consolatory words, the words of consolation. Then Adam receives words from his Lord, and he turned to him mercifully. God forgives him? Truly is oft returning, the merciful. It's definitely not a God going out of control. I thought, what point is the author trying to make here? He has missed the whole point and purpose of this story. Next verse. And it repeats what it said before us. So we said, go down from this state, all of you together. And truly there will come, guidance, come from me guidance to you. And whoever follows my guidance, no fear shall come upon them, nor shall they grieve. If I had any doubt before, that God did, was not punishing Adam by putting him on earth, Adam and his spouse. It was removed when I read this verse and the, and the previous one, because God says, go down from the state, all of you together, and then, and then he embraces Adam. And truly there will come to you guidance from me, Adam and Eve. And whoever follows my guidance, no fear shall come upon them, nor they shall, shall they grieve. It's a tender scene. Adam. 
and his spouse repented in the previous verse. God forgive them. But he tells them, but you have to go down from the state in which you were. They're obviously fearful. They're obviously somewhat panicked. This is all new to them. And what does God say to them? He says, but don't worry. Guidance will come from me, and whoever follows my guidance, no fear shall come upon them, nor shall they grieve. It's like a pa parent addressing a hurt child, or a penitent child. Don't worry about it. You'll be all right. Don't panic. I'm not here to hurt you. Don't be afraid. You'll be all right. There will come guidance from me. And as long as you follow my guidance, you'll have nothing to fear, nor shall you grieve. I know you're afraid. I know this is new for you. I know this is hard for you. But you have to go through it. But don't worry. I'll be with you. Just follow my guidance. You have nothing to grieve. <clears throat> the last verse switches to the past tense. Up to this point, we're talking about the beginnings of mankind. This verse transports us to the very end of the human drama, looking back on the history of mankind. And it says, and those who rejected and gave the lie to our signs, past tense, these are friends of the fire. They dwelled therein. Notice how it switches to a whole other scene. It would be unfair to say this to the couple. They've just been through a lot. So it doesn't address them personally. It addresses the reader. It takes them to the future, to the day of judgment. And looks back at human history and says, and those who rejected and gave the lie to our signs, these are the friends of the fire. They dwelled therein. They're friends of the fire? Curious choice of words. The author is constantly making intriguing, intriguing choices of words. Do people befriend the suffering that awaits them in the next life, I thought? They're friends of the fire? Do people court? Do they pursue? Do they embrace the misery that's going to meet them in the hereafter? How, I thought. It says they dwelled therein. When? In the past? What? Do they already create or live in some kind of hell in this life that's organically connected to the hell they experience in the next? What was he saying here? Later in the Quran, I would read a verse like, that says this, in your mutual rivalry for the things of the world, right? uh, I gotta remember it, you're diverted. In your mutual rivalry for piling up the things of the world, you are diverted. Then it says, but then you will know when you die. And then it says, and then again you will know when you reach your next existence. But then it says, but if you could see right now with the eye of reality, you would certainly see the hell. What hell? The one you're already in. Is that what the author is trying to say? Is there an organic link between what we do in this life and to what we experience in the next? Do we create our own? Do we start? Do we, in a sense, make ourselves into that type of creature that experiences either pain or happiness in the next life? Too many questions were coming into my mind. And I kept seeing a picture going in and out of focus. And I was only 38, 39 verses through the Quran and the seven in the opening chapter. So 46 verses. It's only a few pages through the Quran. I had a whole Quran to go. But I was determined to pursue it and find how the answer, author deals with those questions. So I thought he was a genius up to this point. I thought he was a genius beyond any genius I had ever read. Or at least I thought he could be. But I thought as I read the ver through the rest of the Quran, he'd start to fall apart, make mistakes, contradict himself. So I continued reading. I just intrigued. I was wondering when he was going to trip over his own feet. Okay, three things the author seemed to be emphasizing in this story, three things that intrigued me most. It seemed that he was emphasizing in response to the angel's question, why create this most corrupt and worst creature? Are you getting really exhausted? Seriously. Because I could finish this tomorrow. <laughs> really. No lie. I'm not a politician. I'm telling the truth. <clears throat> Okay, I'll go a little further until you get too exhausted. Just raise your hands. 
<laughs> okay. Because you've been at it a long time already. You know? Okay, now we're in 10 minutes of listening to me talk. But in any case, three things in response to the angel's question he seemed to be emphasizing. One, reason. Right? Human beings have reason. That figures into a response to the angel's question, why create this most destructive being? Second thing he seemed to be emphasizing is choice, and, human, and the human being is a, a creature of choice, and, and he can make moral choices. God has empowered him to make moral choices and to see them through to their normally expected conclusions. At least that's what it seemed to be hinting at. And I have to read the rest of the Quran to see if that was really true. Third thing that seemed to be emphasized in the story is that human beings will suffer. And God just says, yeah, they're going to suffer. Fourth thing he seems to emphasize, we're not put here as a punishment. We're not put here as a punishment. Because notice when he forgives Adam, he doesn't pop him and his, he and his wife back in heaven. As a matter of fact, there was nothing in the story to indicate that this life was a punishment. But when I read that verse that said he had forgiven Adam and Eve, I thought, okay, put him back into heaven. You forgave him. You know, when I penalize my daughters for doing something wrong, I subtract $5 from their allowance. If they come and cry, I ought to, my wife says I'm a marshmallow. If they come and cry to me, I say, okay, okay, you're forgiven. And then I give them back the $5. If I kept the $5, they'd say to me, Daddy, I thought I was forgiven. <laughs> Make up your mind. Am I punished or am I forgiven? Well, you're forgiven, but I'll keep the $5. <laughs> well, that's not fair. You forgave me. So why doesn't God put Adam and Eve back into heaven? Because life is not a punishment. This is from the beginning of the story to the end. We had known from the very beginning, and it was consistent throughout, that he's going to put them there as his representative, potentially, on earth. Human beings have the potential to represent them. Somehow that figures into a response to the angel's question. So three things are emphasized. Well, one, life is not a punishment. Two, human beings are creatures of intellect. Three, they have the ability to make choices. They have the ability to exercise will. And third, that they're going to suffer. And somehow, it seems, the author was emphasizing these in the story of man. Now, I thought I could just be wrong, deluding myself, really, projecting my own neurosis onto this story, my own childhood trauma onto the story. So, as I read through the Quran, I tried to keep my mind and eye open for anything that would contradict what I had thought. And as I read through it, sure enough, I found confirmation of, just, of what I just said. Reason, man's ability to reason, gets such strong emphasis in the Quran that sometimes you would think that the author is some kind of, in, you know, tremendous, has a tremendous faith in philosophy and reason, like no other religious mind in history. Because I was always taught that reason and faith conflict, that somewhere along the line, you know, they, got, they contradict the age-old conflict between faith and reason. If you take reason too far, you'll naturally get, arrive at conflicts with faith. This author, author says exactly the opposite, saying that people do not believe, or people that come, come upon false beliefs, because they do not use their reason. He makes the point again and again and again. He puts so much emphasis on reason that one famous Western Orientalist who studied the Quran said, the Quran puts so much emphasis on reason that you would think that disbelief is nothing more than an infirmity of the human mind. An inability to use it, like an illness in your mind. Mental sickness. That's how much emphasis he puts on reason. That was Henri Lemens who said that. Another Orientalist, and every Orientalist that has ever written about the Quran has more or less emphasized this point. Yeah. Maxime Rodinson, one of the leading Orientalists in France, wrote, the Quran continually expounds the rational proofs of God's omnipotence, the wonders of creation, such as the gestation of animals, the movement of heavenly bodies, atmospheric phenomena, the variety of animal and vegetable life, so marvelously well adapted to men's needs. He's not a Muslim, but he, he was impressed by this. He said, all those things are signs for those of insight. 
and he quotes the Quran here. Repeated about 50 times in the Quran is the Arabic verb, which means to connect ideas together, to reason, to understand an intellectual argument. 13 times, he says, we come upon the refrain after a piece of reasoning. Have you then no sense? Will you not use your reason? The infidels, those who remain insensible to Muhammad's preaching, are stigmatized as a people of no intelligence. Persons incapable of the intellectual effort needed to cast off routine thinking. And he gives several references. In this respect, they are like cattle. Huh. The Quran complains that people disbelieve or corrupt religion because they do not use the, re the reason. They refuse to reason, says the Quran, and I have 10 references here. And there are people who do not reason, says the Quran, and I have 12 references here. It says, will you not reason, the Quran asks repeatedly, again and again and again. God reveals signs, lessons, and admonitions so that perhaps you will use your reason, the Quran says again and again. From the author's viewpoint, reason and faith are allies as are illogic and false belief. And he clearly sets the conflict along these lines. The right way is clearly distinct from error, he says. Those who benefit most from the Quran, the author says, are persons of insight, firmly rooted in knowledge, used to reason, and stand on clear evidence and proof. While those who oppose revelations, the revelation are deluded and manifest error, ignorant, foolish, have no understanding, only follow surmise and conjecture, and blindly hear, adhere to, tra tra excuse me, to tradition. In an almost Socratic style, the author asks the reader again and again and again, what do you think? Have you considered this? Do you suppose? Do you ponder? Do you not think? The message is clear. And in order to be guided to truer faith, we need to free ourselves from inherited notions and examine our beliefs rationally. That was clearly the position of the author. He, I thought he was walking a dangerous, slippery slope. Because once you start pushing too much for reason, you'll eventually start trapping yourself and presenting a system that cannot stand up to its demands. But I was intrigued. Does the author also emphasize, excuse me, choice like I thought he did? Does he emphasize that human beings are a choosing creature and this plays a major role in their development on earth? And the answer is yes. Let there be no compulsion in religion. The right way is henceforth clearly distinct from error, he says. In another verse, had we willed, had God willed, he could indeed have guided all of you. He could have indeed have guided all of you. I thought, I read those, I, when I would come across those verses, I'd say, why not? Guide us all. Why did you not do that? Do not the believers know that had God willed, he could have guided all mankind? Why didn't he? Why didn't he make us capable of choosing the wrong way? And if God had willed, we could have given every soul its guidance. Okay, make us all clones of one another, rightly guided, angels. Instead, he doesn't. He lets us make choices, lets us make errors, lets us make mistakes, let, gives us an intellect. Quran emphasizes, hopefully, you will learn from your mistakes. The Quran puts so much emphasis on trial and error. <laughs> it says it explicitly many, many times. You will face trial. You will face trial. We tried you this way. We tried you that way. We tried you this way. We test you this way. We test you that way. It's, a, it's like it's a professor talking to his class. It has an almost academic tone. And you will err. And hopefully you will correct your errors, it says. You will repent. You will realize your error and turn yourself around. Enlightenment has come from your God. He who sees does so to his own good. He who is blind is so to his own hurt. It is your choice. And whoever is guided is only to his own gain. And if any stray, say, I am only a warner, tells the prophet. It's up to you. I don't make your choices for you. And God wants us to choose on our own. We have revealed to you the book with the truth for mankind. He who lets himself be guided does so to his own good. 
He who lets himself astray does so to his own hurt. It's your choice. And the Quran says that in an almost dispassionate tone. It's your choice. You have the right to choose. God's not going to force the choices down your throat. He's not going to make you do anything when it comes to primary critical moral choices. You have to make them yourself. He's essentially telling the audience. What does he have to say about suffering? Okay, I was intrigued. The author is consistent. Emphasizes reason, emphasizes choice. What does he have to say about suffering? Well, here's what he has to say. Is it really necessary, I thought? What possible purpose could it serve? Most assuredly, we, we will try you with something of danger and hunger and the loss of worldly goods, of your loss of your lives and the fruits of your labor. But give glad tidings to those who are patient in adversity, who when calamity befalls them say, truly unto God do we belong, and truly unto him we shall return. Most assuredly, we will try you, the Quran says, with danger, suffering, loss of worldly goods, thank you, lives and the fruits of your labor. Okay. Most assuredly, uh, could somebody get that for me? <laughs> but most assuredly, you will suffer. Why? I thought, why? Do you think that you can enter paradise without having suffered like those who passed away before you? Why not? Just pop us up. Beam me up, Scotty, I thought to myself. Do you think that you could enter paradise without having suffered like those who passed away before you? Why not? Misfortune and hardship befell them, and so shaken were they that the apostle, we're talking about good people here suffering, that the apostle and the believers with him would exclaim, when will God's help come? Oh, truly, God's help is always near, the verse says. You are going to suffer. Why? You will certainly be tried in your possessions and yourselves, it says. Another verse, every soul must taste of death, and we will try you with calamity and prosperity, both as a means of trial. We'll test you with both. What's the point of it? And to us, you are returned. In another verse it says, O mankind, truly you've been toiling towards your Lord in painful toil, but you shall meet him. How do you toil towards God? How does suffering bring us any closer to God? Just, do you know? I know it's, a lot of you do, but, you know, it's a rhetorical question. You know, it's sort of a, well, never mind. <laughs> this verse, I was ready to just throw the Quran down. I got so angry when I read the beginning of this one. We certainly have created man to face distress. We first certainly have created man to face distress. What? We certainly have created man to face distress. You created us to face distress? You created us to suffer? Are we made to face distress? I started to think about it in another way. Are we eminently well suited for to face distress? Are we a creature that thrives on distress? Do we thrive on suffering? Does that play a major role in our development, in our progress, in our growth? When I thought about it that way, I said, yes, of course. I could see that in this life, we are eminently well suited to face distress more than any other creature about us. And that sort of charts our intellectual evolution and our progress. But how could that bring us any closer to God? What does that have to do with our relationship with God? What does that have anything to do with the hereafter? Does he think that no one has power over him? He will say, I have wasted much wealth. Does he think that no one sees him? He's trying to say, Are you, you think you're down here alone, just going through this for no po point or purpose? Have we not given him two eyes to see with, a tongue to speak and communicate with, and two lips to communicate with, and pointed out to him the two conspicuous ways? What are the two conspicuous ways? Haven't I given you all these things to, to see and to learn with and to communicate with? Can't you just open your eyes and see it? And understand from talking to others and looking at other people around you and seeing everything around you? Can't you see the two conspicuous ways? When I read this verse, I was at the 90th chapter of the Quran. I had like 30 pages to go and I still was in the dark. 
What two conspicuous ways? What can I see? And what will make you comprehend? Oh, but he attempts not the uphill climb. And what will make you comprehend the uphill climb? Is life an uphill climb? Why does life have to be an uphill climb? Why can't it be a downward slope? Or a level surface? Why does it have to be an upward climb? Why does it have to be hard? And what will make you comprehend the uphill climb? It is to free a slave, or to feed in a day of hunger an orphan nearly related, or the poor one lying in the dust. Then he or she is of those who believe. Then he or she is one of those who exhorts one another to patience. Then he or she is one of those who exhorts others to mercy. What? The two conspicuous ways? These are the two conspicuous ways. The uphill climb is one. And what is it about? Helping others? Self-sacrifice? Freeing a slave? Helping a poor one lying in the dust? Giving of yourself? When I read this verse, the first thing I thought about, believe it or not, was my mother. Because my mom had always told me that, Jeff, life is not about taking. Life is not about succeeding. Life is not about obtaining your material goals. Life, Jeff, is about giving. Life is about giving to others. She said, as long as you have something to give, no matter how small, you're never poor, you're always rich. I said to her, Mom, God, you just don't get it, do you? Life is not about giving, Mom. Life is not about self-sacrifice. Life is about getting ahead. Life is about protecting oneself. Life is about not letting people step on you. Life is about insulating yourself from harm for as long as you can. This world, Mom, as Dad has taught me, and he's right, is a dog-eat-dog -dog world. And it's not about any of the things you say. It's about survival. But here at 28 years old, when I thought back on my mom, I realized that she was always a peaceful, happy, contented, restful, serene person. And at the same time, I was angry, hostile. I wouldn't show it to people around me, but inside I felt it. I felt that life was empty, chaotic, uncertain, fragile, scary. <coughs> when I read this verse, I realized that at least in that sense, my the Quran was right, and so was my mom. There are two conspicuous ways. If you just look around you, look at the people that are happy. Look at the people that really seem to have joy in life. The real joyful people in life. They're the people who give of themselves, who, self who, who engage in self-sacrifice. And they can't seem to get enough. And you look at the people who squander and hoard, and they're miserable. They never could get enough. I realized that there are two conspicuous ways in life. But I didn't see how that had to do with anything that, any ultimate purpose behind it. Is that what the author is saying, I thought? That life is just to be good and nice to people so you feel good inside? As Michael Jackson used to say, to make the world a better place for you and me? No, is that it? I couldn't find a connection. And I never did, so goodbye. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. But we're almost out of time, so I'll try to tie this up. It's hard, you know. This takes 100 pages of my next book. OK, I thought. The author claims that these things, suffering, choice, intellect, play a role in, our, in something, in our purpose of life. What possible purpose can they play? Well, God must have had a reason for producing us on Earth. So first, I thought I would concentrate on what this kind of person does God want to produce? And sure enough, it's not hard to find. The Quran says that God intends to produce through this earthly experience a people who will relate to him, develop a relationship to him, the relationship that the Quran describes as a relationship of love. And it says it again and again. For example, yet there are men who take others besides God as equal, loving them as they should love God. But those who believe love God more ardently. Say, another verse, if you love God, follow me and God will love you. And forgive you your faults, for God is the forgiving, the merciful. O you who believe, if any from among you should turn back from his faith, then God will assuredly bring a people he loves 
and who love Him. In many places it also says, God loves this type of person, God loves that type of person, God loves this and people, God loves that and doesn't love this type of people, and doesn't love people who do that. Or not people, but mostly the acts. God does not love the transgressor. God does not love the hateful. God does not, and so forth. And the Quran assures us that through this earthly experience, especially watch the conversations in the Quran between Satan and God. God is always in total control. Satan in the Quran is really rather a weak creature. In other traditions, he might have tremendous power. But in the Quran, he says, I have no power over you. I but whisper, and you follow. Remember? And it says on the Day of Judgment, he's going to say to those who followed him, I had no power over you whatsoever. I only whisper, and you follow. But in the conversations between God and Satan in the Quran, we re it reveals something very important. That yes, there will be people who go astray. Yes, there will be people that destroy themselves in this life. But God guarantees in the Quran that there will be a subset of humanity. Though there will definitely, this human experience will produce those who choose to enter a relationship with God, who choose to be bound by God in love, and whom God will love in, uh, mutually. They're, they'll enter in a mutual relationship of love. There will definitely, this earthly experience will definitely produce those type of people. Okay, but I mean, this is just too much to handle. I have all these questions in my mind, all these things to deal with. Choice, reason, suffering. God hopes, God intends to produce through this earthly experience and says it certainly will produce a subset of this humanity that will enter into a relationship of love with him. What does that have to do with all these other things? Suffering, choice, etc. Couldn't he just make us love him? Program us to love him? Love us in return? Pop us into heaven? Avoid the suffering? What? <clears throat> hmm. Okay, so Quran says that God wants to enter into a relationship with humanity and that this human experience will definitely produce a certain segment that will relate to him. So here I am, I'm done with the Quran, and I'm trying to think what could the possible connection be? So what's the natural place to look? Well, if it has to do with the relationship between God, we should look in the Quran what the Quran expects from man and what the Quran tells us of God, and then we should try to see if there's any relationship between the two. I mean, that seems like a natural thing to do. Because if the issue comes down to relating to God, we should discover in the Quran what it says about the believers and the disbelievers, those who are brought near to God and those who are not, and God, and see if there's any possible connection between the two. Okay. So, what does the Qur'an expect from mankind? Well, it's so simple in the Qur'an, it's almost the type of thing you just like to just read over and, for, you know, neglect. Because God expects, excuse me, of people that they believe that they will believe and do good. What? Believe and do good? Okay, I get the belief part. If you're going to have a relationship with God, you certainly must believe in Him. You can't just reject Him, to turn your back and walk and get, reject His very existence, definitely. But what does doing good have to do with forging a relationship with God? <laughs> you want us to do, make us good, you know, whatever. But even so, what difference does it make? So I looked up what kind of acts the Quran said are good. I just wrote a partial this. I didn't look them up. I just tried to remember from my reading of it. And not unexpectedly, it consists of those acts and attributes that are sort of universally recognized as virtuous. Good deeds are such, for example, we should show compassion to others. We should be merciful. We should forgive others. We should be just. We should protect the weak, defend the oppressed, feed the poor, seek knowledge and wisdom, be generous, truthful, kind, peaceful, and love others. And we should teach others these same things and learn them and grow in them as well. But why? In one verse it says, Truly those who believe and do good will the most merciful endow with love. 
And to this end we have made this easy to understand in your own tongue, so that you may convey this glad news to the God conscious and warn those given to contention. You're supposed to grow in love of your fellow man. But why? I had not a clue, but I did list them. Hope I could get here without sabotaging this. Somebody left your glass, their glasses here. <laughs> okay, so we're supposed to grow in love of our fellow man. You probably can't read this anyway, if you're way in the back. Comba compassion, this is very small. Love, right, compassion, forgiveness. I just, you know, listed them. I had nothing else to do that day. I was watching a football game. Love, compassion, forgiveness, caring, justice, truth, truth. What are some of the other ones I said? Protect the weak, protective of the weak, kindness, forgiveness. What did I leave out? <laughs> Mercy, mercy, <laughs> mercy, compassion, etc. Compassion. <clears throat> I got compassion. <laughs> okay. It wasn't very helpful, but I wrote them down. Okay, but I didn't complete my project. Okay, what does the Quran tell us about God? Now, this is where it gets tricky. Because the Quran tells us, and naturally it's so, that nothing compares with God. That he is beyond rational definition, or even understanding, I would assume. Nothing com compares to him. Reason cannot encompass him. If all the trees were pens, and, all the, sea, and the sea was ink, and seven seas like it, ink as well, you could never exhaust the words of God, the Quran tells us. You could never, in your reason, encompass him. What good does that do me? Here I'm trying to see the connection between us doing good and our relationship with God, and there better be an intrinsic connection, or I'm walking from this Quran. Well, I didn't believe in God at this point anyway. But there better be an intrinsic connection or the author has failed to guide as he said he would. But God is incomparable. We cannot come to know God. We hardly understand the human mind. How can we understand God? How can we come to know God? I could come to you, know you, because I have some sort of connection to you. We are alike. I could approach you physically, because you're a physical creature. I could walk over to you. Don't get scared. <laughs> All right? I just move my body closer to yours. I could approach you rationally, through the intellect, right? by discussion and argumentation and so forth, right? by the exercise of reason. I could approach you guys, any of you, in terms of feelings, right? by appealing to your emotions, because right? we share them both. But in order to approach somebody, you've got to approach them by what they are. We could come to understand another because we share something. We could approach a creature or a being. We approach a being by what they and we are. But how do you approach God? We're finite, he's infinite. We're corporeal creatures, he's incorporeal. Right? We're limited to this time and space environment, he transcends it. Yeah. Just about anything you can think of that we possess, he possesses it to an infinite degree, transcends that, we don't compare. How can we come to know God? How can we have this relationship you talked about? Sorry, there's just no answer to that. No, no there is, of course. But that's the way I felt. Sorry, there's no answer to it. And so I left the Quran, I finished reading it, I put it down. And about two weeks passed, and I don't know what I was doing one day. I was sitting, thinking about something totally removed from religion. And then I thought, wait a minute. The Quran does provide us some information about God. But I had neglected it, ignored it, time and time again. There are thousands of descriptions in the Quran about God that I just had never seen. 
If I just opened to the beginning of any surah, or looked on almost any page and came to the completion of a verse, I would have found many, many such references. You know, you all, all the Muslims, I'm sure, know what I'm talking about. Because throughout the Quran, time and time again, punctuating passages, crowning passages, beginning surahs, you find what the Quran refers to as the beautiful names of God. You can't miss them. And they tell us something about God right. for our benefit. And as I thought about them in my head, I began to list them in my head. The beautiful names of God. And I thought about them in my head. What are they? God is the loving. God is the compassionate. God is the forgiving. God is the caring. There's dozens and dozens of them. God is the just. He is the truth or the truthful. He is the protector. He is the kind. God is the forgiving. Just read through the Quran. You can't miss these. He is the merciful. And on and on and on. I didn't complete this list and I didn't complete this one either. But I looked in my mind at the two lists I visualized for the qualities God wants us to develop and the qualities that the Quran use, uses to describe God. And then I just immediately saw the whole, saw the picture. So what the author was telling us. Because the author is telling us that yes, your reason may not be able to fully encompass God, but you are to grow and learn love. Grow in your ability to learn and show love. Why? Because God is the loving. You're, the more you grow in compassion, the more you come to receive and experience and understand God's infinite compassion. Because the Quran lets us know that all compassion ultimately comes from God, originates from God. The more you grow in forgiveness, the more you come to receive and experience and to know the forgiving, who is God. The more you grow in your ability to care for others, the more you grow in your experience of and understanding of and ability to know the caring. You don't reach it through reason, you reach it through experience. The same way I understand you in this audience. I don't know you rationally. I know you because we share common experiences. God is the caring, infinite source of caring according to the Quran, but we could grow in our ability to care for others. The more we grow in justice, the more we come to understand experience and to know the just. The more we grow in truth, the more we come to know, experience, and represent the truthful. And the Quran says we're here to represent God. The more we know of protectiveness of the weak and the downtrodden, the more we come to know the protector. The more we know of kindness, the more we come to know, experience, and receive the beauty that only the kind could give us. Forgiveness, forgiving, merciful, merciful, compassionate, compassionate, and on and on. When I explained that to my daughters, they said, Daddy, what are you trying to say? And I told them this. I said, pretend that we have a dog, some goldfish, and three daughters. Pretend that. I do have three daughters. So at least they could relate to that. I told them, no matter how much of my love, no matter how much of my compassion, no how much, how much of my comparing, how much of my real self I shower on that goldfish, that goldfish could only experience my love, my compassion, my caring, my justice to a very limited degree. Because it's a very primitive creature. It only knows and could learn and could experience love, compassion, forgiveness, etc. to a very minuscule level. But my dog, Rex, <laughs> I don't have a dog, but I had one, Rex, once. But my dog, he could know and experience and feel 
my love, my compassion, my caring, myself, my being, to a much higher level because he's a more developed creature. He knows through his own life experiences, he experiences through his own life experiences a certain amount of love, compassion, forgiveness, not just as a receiver, but as a giver as well, which is more important. Because when you give love, you're experiencing loving on a whole nother level than just receiving. You're learning it. But I told her, look at you three guys. Look at you three guys, I said to my daughters. As you grow, you will come to learn, know, and experience love, compassion, forgiveness on a much higher level, and a higher level. And it's up to you how high you want to go. But the more you grow in love, compassion, mercy, forgiveness, etc., the more you could experience whatever love, mercy, compassion, forgiveness, etc., that I have to give to you. The more you could experience me, the more you could experience my being. And that's essentially what the author seems to be telling us. That the more we grow in all these, the more we could experience the infinite love, compassion, forgiveness, caring, justice, that is God. <clears throat> and so all the pieces were coming together for me. All I had to do was just read any page of the Quran. There were times and times again, there were signs there were, it was staring me right in the face. Except that I read it and never opened my eyes to see it. And it took me reading the entire scripture before it was open to me. But wait a minute, I said. Okay, granted. You know, the more we grow in love, the more we could experience God's loving. The more, and, and people do. The believers, they experience it in prayer. They experience it in ritual. They talk about those powerful moments when they experience God's presence. No. They do experience it. And the Quran promises that you will definitely experience it to some degree in this life, but in the next life when all distractions are swept away and all you take to the next life is your growth in these, your real person. If you have grown in these, if you haven't become bankrupt in these, you will be able to experience God's beauty, His presence, His being to higher and higher degrees. <clears throat> but I thought, wait a minute, there's something wrong here. I almost got lured, seduced into accepting this picture. I almost got seduced into accepting this picture, but then I remembered my questions. And I remembered the angel's question. I mean, wait a minute, guys. Why didn't God just program these in us? Why didn't He just program us to be loving, compassionate, forgiveness, etc., instead of making us go through this turmoil, this torture on earth? Are you following me? And why didn't He just program us to be that way? Was the suffering all necessary? Was the pain of it all necessary? Did I gain anything from my childhood? I mean, what did I learn? Why did I have to suffer? You know, why do you have to suffer? Why did it give me choice? Why did it give me intellect? Just make me love. Just make me have compassion. Just like that. Well, if you read the Quran, don't even read the Quran. Just think about it yourself. You know? In order to grow in love, and as creatures, the Quran says, every creature grows. Creatures are growing entities. And the Quran says that God provides every creature with the environment, the soil, if you will, the environment, the growing environment that is necessary for its growth. But if we are to grow in love, compassion, forgiveness, caring, etc., how does that contribute to that environment? Are these necessary ingredients for us to grow in these, and us to develop these, and us to learn these and acquire these? And I think if you think about it for a minute, the answer is obviously yes. I mean, think about compassion, for example. How can you have compassion if there is no suffering? If there is not some vulnerable creature to turn to? If some creature is not dependent on you? 
How could you exercise, learn, and grow in compassion? Unless you are the infinite source of it already, which none of us are, since none of us are God. We are creatures, we become. How can we become compassionate without knowing vulnerability, weakness, suffering, and others that we could turn to? How, what is compassion without choice? A compassionate act is an act where you choose to help someone, when you have the option not to. If I take a banana, eat it, take the peel, throw it over my shoulder, it lands in the street, a criminal comes by on his way to rob a pocketbook from an old lady standing over there and trips on the banana peel and falls on the ground. My throwing the banana peel over my shoulder was not a compassionate act. Because I really didn't choose to do that. A compassionate act requires choice. It also requires intellect. Because when you reach out to someone in compassion, you weigh in your minds how much of yourself you're going to invest in reaching out to that person. And you say to yourself, do I really want to do this? How much time is it going to require? I've got to go to work. I might, you know, might not make any money today. Yeah. Besides, you know, I'll have to be helping this person for the next couple hours. I have to take him to the hospital. See him the, you know, your mind is weighing how much of yourself is going to be invested in that. You could program a computer to never make an incorrect statement, but it doesn't become a truthful computer. I never heard anybody say to me, Jeff, you know that computer of yours? It's the most truthful computer I've ever seen. Because huh? truth is not just making incorrect statements, uh, correct statements. Truth is being truthful is a choice. It's understanding the decision you're making. It requires intellect. And if that truth involves you in the possibility of suffering, the more that is in stake in telling the truth, the greater you rise to that truth, the greater that is an act of truth. Oh, sorry. Because <laughs> I was going like this. <clears throat> what else do I have written here? Forgiveness is a choice. What is forgiveness without choice? What is forgiveness if somebody can't wrong you, which produces suffering? What is forgiveness without intellect? If you don't understand what the person has done to you, what the person is saying when they ask you for forgiveness. All these things, suffering, choice, and intellect, are integral to our growth in these. Are you following me? Uh, one last example, the famous wedding vow. You promise to stick with somebody in sickness and in health. What's the other one? <laughs> I said it so long ago, I can't remember. <laughs> in sickness and health, for richer or for poorer, until death do we part. It asks us to make that commitment. It acknowledges the essential, the essential element of suffering and growing in love, in love. And it's a choice. We make that vow. That vow is a choice. Do you, Jeff Lang, promise to take Raga, so forth, <laughs> for richer or for poorer, in sickness and health? I start thinking about it. Wait a minute now. No, I didn't. <laughs> you know? I was very pleased to do that. But it was a choice. And it's giving you the choice. Understand this. When you make that vow, it's in sickness and health, richer or poorer, till death, who do you part? It's saying, think about it. Understand what kind of choice you're making. No, these three things are integral in our growth in these. Suffering, choice, intellect, are absolutely necessary to grow in these. You pull anyone out of this equation called life, and we don't have it as we know it. We cannot grow in these as we know it to very high levels. Finally, in the last two minutes, I'll just simply say this. So when the Quran talks about sin, it talks about people who grow bankrupt in these, more or less. A famous symbol in the Quran is the balance on the Day of Judgment that weighs your goodness. And people are heavy in goodness. People who are full of goodness. They can experience paradise in the next life. And perhaps, to greater and greater degrees, God's presence. Because the more we know of goodness, the more we grow in goodness, the more we are able to experience, receive, and know the infinite goodness of God. 
But what if we go the opposite direction? What if instead of developing the qualities of love, compassion, forgiveness, caring, we do just the opposite? We head in the opposite direction. When we become, instead of being heavy in these qualities on the Day of Judgment, we become extremely light in these qualities when we enter in the next life. So instead of becoming love, loving, we become hateful, compassionate, miserly, forgiving, vengeful, caring, whatever, mean. <laughs> justice, dis, justice, cruel, I don't know, truth, liar, protective, destructive, and so forth. What if we go in the opposite direction and become primarily those? Well then we are just, as the Quran says, destroying yourself. Because if you're bankrupt of those, then this, growth in this, will be the only thing that matters as you go into the next life. You bring nothing else with you but what you really are. And if you are not, have not developed this, then you're going to suffer severely because you cannot experience any of the beauty that awaits you in the next life. You'll experience just the opposite. As so the Quran compares growth in this life, our physical growth in the womb, to our spiritual growth in this life. And if you think about it, when a creature grows in, its, in the mother's womb, it's a primarily physical growth. When it comes into this life, when it is born, you see the effects of that growth concretely right before you. When a child enters this world, the growth it went through in a womb, its physical growth, is manifested before you in that creature's being. But what the Quran t seems to be to suggest is that when we are the type of spiritual growth we obtain in this life, when we go into the next life, it too will be manifested in exactly what we are. And so to go in this next life bankrupt of these, it's like coming into this life bankrupt, bereft of every physical quality you need to experience some peace, some joy, some comfort in this life. So if you are bereft of these, it would be like coming into this life without any skin to protect you from the cold or the heat, with your nerves exposed and all you know is pain, the inability to breathe and you're gasping for air, I'm not trying to scare any of you, I'm just <laughs> presenting an analogy. You know, choking for your breath, blind, you cannot see. And the Quran says the spiritually blind in this life will come out blind in the next life to reality. Yeah. So to not grow in these, to grow in the opposite, to become basically evil, is, according to the Quran, self-destruction. And so when the Quran speaks of sin, it frequently says, you don't sin primarily against God. You don't even primarily sin against your victims. The Quran says, the sinner primarily commits sin against themselves. They destroy themselves, the Quran says. And it says God gives you every, at least when you, he exposes you to the Quran, gives you every possible warning about that. And then it says, and still, they turn their backs. Let's see, what else do I want to say? I guess I said enough. It's quarter to ten, you're almost exhausted. And plus, I'm sure you want to see KU hopefully win their basketball game, University of Kansas. So I'll sort of end it there. And uh, like I said, I'm trying to summarize 100 pages in just two hours. But I appreciate you coming and listening for all of two hours. And uh, I wish you all the best. And uh, I, uh, thank you so much, you kind Purdue people. I'll take 15. It's only a 20 minute speech tomorrow. If you have some questions, please raise your hand. Yes? Yes, question. Uh, in reading some of the Quran, which I have read objectively myself, I see some very objective things to put down, love, compassion, forgiveness, etc. Uh, when I read about
about, let's say, a Muslim making a Hajj to Mecca, uh, it seems very ritualized. It seems uh, a lot of other uh, theological things, which is kind of a tool to uh, types of things that uh, Catholicism would have, a lot of types of uh, ritual and things like that. Now, could you please comment on, from the point of view of a rationalist, after you had encountered the very rational basis upon which yes. uh, Islam is apparently based? Uh, how did you comprehend that type of uh, emphasis on ritual, specifically uh, the Hajj? Can I, can I answer that just in general about ritual? The more I prayed, the more powerful those prayers became spiritually. You know, the more I, the idea is, is that the more you develop these qualities in yourself, the more you will experience God's being in this life and the next. And the primary way the believer, and one of the primary ways the believer experiences God's presence or God's being is through ritual. Um, so that when a person grows in these, they suddenly find that they're in their prayers, they, have, they become more and more powerful spiritually. Are you following me? So that they feel God's presence, they feel a warmth, a, p a power, a mercy coming over them. So it's seen, and same with the other rituals, the more they grow in this, following this program, the more they grow in this, the more powerful and more beautiful the rituals become. The idea in the Quran is, is that God's gifts, I'm just thinking out loud here, that God's gifts to humanity are tremendous, are tremendous, beyond count, it says. But if you think about it, in every relationship, both people engaged in this relationship have to have something to give to that relationship. Or it's not a relationship, not a, a healthy relationship. In a healthy relationship, both people involved in the relationship must have something to give. Ritual gives the believers a way to give back to God, to share with God with what in reality is already His. For example, I'll give you an analogy. Two days ago, my daughters came to me, Sarah and Fatin. They said, Daddy, can we have 10 bucks a piece? I said, why? Because we want to buy you a present. <laughs> I gave them each, of course I gave them the $10. Yeah. And they went to the store and bought me a present. Now, I didn't need their gift. I didn't need it. It's mine already, the $10. It did nothing for me materially. It did nothing for me concretely. But I loved the love behind it. And I know that it brings me and them closer together. In the same way, there's nothing that we could give back to God that is not, or give to God that is not in reality His. But what the rituals allow the believer to do is to give to God what really is in reality His. And as the Quran shows, God does not need what we give. But it also shows He loves the intention behind it, and He knows it brings us closer together. And so when the Muslim, or the believer, grows in these, and devotes himself in ritual to God, gives to God, what in reality seems point worthless to God. I mean, he's God. Nonetheless, you know, he is being brought closer to God through that giving, and he feels God's love in that ritual, and he experiences it, and he feels himself giving that love back to God. So it becomes a very powerful experience that grows in intensity as a person grows in these. You know, and so you'll find people who are very devout, very good, who engage in ritual, engage in ritual, they report having really intense, beautiful experiences in them. Not all the time. And usually unanticipated. They don't plan them, but they experience them nonetheless. And, then, and also it helps discipline and refine your spirituality. But that's a whole other issue. 
But I, I chose to answer it from that perspective. Is that okay? Thanks for the question. Great question. Yes. Yeah, I have read your book, uh, Struggling to Surrender. Oh. And uh, I have read uh, other mathematicians uh, talking about uh, agnostic belief and atheism. And uh, they've come out to be very successful and very prolific uh, believers later on. Yes. Is there a connection or a correlation between being an atheist in the earlier stage of life and being a very devout Muslim or a believer and being a contributing member to the, to the belief uh, of uh, submission, particularly uh, versus Dr. Russell and uh, yes. people. Uh, yeah. Although they didn't pronounce themselves as Muslims, but uh, evidence suggested that they are not very far from it, more than yeah. speculation. Yeah. yeah, somebody asked me to reiterate your question for the camera. I'm trying to remember, let's see. So you said I was an atheist, yes, sort of a rationalist. And then uh, I uh, became a Muslim. And is there a connection, you think, between the um, interval of atheism that I went through for 12 years? And has that played an a integral part in, uh, in making me a believer? actually, it seems like you're saying, and in what I've, whatever I've contributed, and I think it's minor, to this, to uh, the, the religious dialogue in this community. Am I right? I believe that there is a connection, because most of the mathematicians in the early stage have been very devout, agnostic, and atheists. Yes. They profoundly believe that, well, I found God, and yes. I'm changing my world belief. Yeah. Her, yeah, I think you're right. Uh, I think that um, you know, I think there's all types of believers, but I think that um, I think the experience of atheism you know, and uh, and questioning, you know, the religion you're taught and the ideas that you're surrounded with, etc. That experience of doubt, doubt, even if it turns to atheism, could turn out to be a very positive thing if through that doubt you discover belief and discover God. Are you following me? So, you know, one famous Muslim religious thinker, Al-Ghazali, used to say that you, you don't, you can't achieve a very high level of belief unless you allow yourself to doubt first. Unless you've doubted first. I don't know if that's not necessarily true or not. I don't think my mom ever doubted. But it, but it uh, definitely, she uh, attained a very high level of belief in God. But um, I think that, you know, um, the atheist perspective, you know, can take, can provide a very important perspective in the, uh, in the religious dialogue. You know what I mean? Because most people really do have doubts about faith, but, you know, the, uh, have doubts, but they sort of suppress them or, or whatnot. But after a while, sometimes it eats at them. So, uh, so I think when an atheist becomes a religion who has faced a lot of doubts, has gone to the extreme, to the point where he let it, he's taken his doubts to the point where he rejects the existence of God, if that person could make their way back, that journey has to be a valuable experience to share with others. It's got to be helpful for other people to hear it. I think it must be, or I wouldn't be up here today, you know, wasting all of your time. You know, I think most people come to listen to these because they have doubts themselves, and they, and they want to know, how could somebody who has rationally been led to the denial of God come back to the rational acceptance of the existence of God? I know I didn't do a good job of handling your question, but... Okay. Uh, yes. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Yes. Are you talking about predestination? Are you talking about predestination or destiny? See, there's a difference, because the Quran doesn't say that God predestines anything. You know, the Quran says that God's knowledge is all-encompassing. But since God, according to the Quran, transcends his creation, it'd be foolish to talk about him predestining. Are you following me? 
See, when I say, use the word predestined, I'm talking about destining the future. I'm talking about I'm in the future, looking, I'm in the present, looking forward to the future, and I am determining the future. Are you following me? So when you use the word predestined, you know, you're, the minute you apply the word predestined to God, you are, you are putting God in this space-time environment, or at least time environment, one of our dimensions. Are you following me? But the Quran says that God transcends time and transcends space. You would never, an athe, even the most rabid atheist wouldn't say, uh, Jeff, if God was on a bus from Indianapolis to Chicago, and it, he would never start a question that way because he knows I would not accept the idea that God could be confined to a particular place. In the same way, he's, and it, no one should say, if God is now in the present looking forward to the future and determining things in advance, you immediately started with, an, with a premise that the Quran does not accept. Are you with me? So the wrong word is predestined. You know, the Quran says that nothing happens unless God allows it to happen. Unless God permits it to happen. But the same Quran shows that he permits us to make choices. He permits us, empowers us to make choices and to carry them out to their expected conclusions. God has complete control over the whole human experience. He could stop it in an instant, but he doesn't. It even says in one verse in the Quran, if I wanted you to go out to that field and die in that field, I could have made you do that. And you would have gone right to the, to the place I wanted you to die, and you would have fallen dead right there. But he doesn't. This people he addresses in that verse, he gave them a choice, and they chose to do otherwise. So the point I'm trying to make is, when a Muslim says that God measures, that's the word in the Quran, Qadra, measures all things. You know, that means that he has total control over this creation. That nothing occurs without him allowing it. But it doesn't say that he predestines it. Because the very word predestined contradicts the Quran's concept of God's transcendence of time and space. And it clearly indicates it. Because it says in the Quran that even though various events in history that we see as taking place over a long period of time, for God, it is a single instant. He just says, be, and it is. But to us, it seems like it's taking place, you know, throughout this thousand, sometimes thousands of years. But for God, it's all one, a single blink of an instant, a single, infinite, eternal moment outside of time. I think I talked enough about it. I, I don't want to bore you. Yes? When I mean, God, God knows so we're going to go to hell or heaven. Yeah. yeah, but that's unimportant because you're talking about knowing outside of time. See, the Quran presents life as more like it uses a symbol, like a book. We're living this book right now, right? So we are living this book right now. And we are turning the pages as we live it. God reads the whole book all at once. He's outside of time. Okay? He reads the whole book at once. He sees all the pages at one single moment. You know, but we live them throughout time. Because we're stuck in time. Tomorrow, I cannot jump to tomorrow. Nor can I go back suddenly 50 years. I am lodged in time. I am fixed in time. Tomorrow, an hour from now, I will be at an hour from now. Two hours from now, I will be at an hour from now. Because I am limited by space and by time. But just as God could see all space at once, here's space. I'm sure this diagram helps. There's space. God transcends space. He sees it all at once. I am on my way to Chicago. I don't know that there is a cow in the road. I am driving this way. If I keep on driving, I will eventually run into that cow. God sees it all at once. All space is encompassed by his vision. The Quran says, all is encompassed by his vision. But we are you know, a little bit mobile with respect to space, so we could sort of understand that concept. Here is time. God transcends time. 
He sees it all at once. I mean, I know it's hard for us to conceive because we're stuck in time. Much more limited in time as we are with respect to space. And we make decisions in time and etc. And God's, wisdom, God's knowledge encompasses all of it. As hard as that is for us to believe. But that doesn't contradict that the fact that he lets us make choices, answers our prayers, guides us, etc., etc. So there you are. Yes, sure, he sees the day of judgment. He knows it all. He knows exactly the beginning and the end. But he doesn't make, he doesn't make us make choices. He doesn't predestine our, our destiny. You know? it, doesn't even, it doesn't even say that in the Quran. Anybody else? Yes, sir. I had a, had a quick question about that. When you were talking about how uh, in the beginning uh, the angel asked God, you know, you're going to put this uh, creature on earth that sheds blood and then spreads like, corruption. Spreads corruption. Okay. My question was, how did they have anything? I mean, that was the first man. How did they have any reference? Oh, his question was. When the angels, when God said, I'm about to put a vice strength on earth, a representative on earth, the angels said, will you spread, put therein one who will spread corruption and shed much blood? Will we celebrate your praises and glorify your holiness? And he said, how did, God, how did the angels know that man, what a kind of creature man was going to be? Different Muslim scholars tried to approach that question and stumbled through it. And they took it as part of the problem, I think, is because they took an allegory as history. Are you following me? If it's an allegory, the question is, yeah, it's an allegory to teach us, to teach us, not to tell us the origins of Homo sapiens, but to teach us about human nature and the meaning of our life. So I, in my approach, you know, I know how other people have stumbled through that, but I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna advocate their view because I'm quite, I feel quite strongly that that's an allegory for many reasons. For example, in one verse in the Quran says, uh, we created you in your mother's womb, we shaped you in your mother's womb, so we, gave, we made you in your mother's, we created you. It goes through the stage of creation of a creature in its mother's womb. We, we, we conceived you, we gave you safe lodging, we shaped you in your mother's womb, and then we said to the angels, bow down to Adam. Are you following me? Here it's addressing humanity in the plural. We created you, shaped you in your mother's womb, humanity in the plural. And then we said, bow down to Adam. You know, and then we told the angels, bow down to Adam. If we take that literally, that means the whole human race, ex or not all of us, but a huge amount of the human race existed, right? You and I. And then the angels were commanded to bow down to Adam. I think that's an indication that these verses are not, spo are not telling you uh, it's to be taken literally as history, especially in reference to Adam. Adam, uh, it's an allegory to teach us about uh, God and his relationship to man. That's the way I approach it. If people want to approach it as history, I have no problem with that. Just allow me the right to allow God the right to, what? <laughs> to allow God the right to reveal truths that, as he will without having to force historical inter interpretations on verses that may be allegorical. Because the Quran does say that God uses allegory. It says there are verses that are plain, and clear, and they are the fundamental part of that book, the Quran, and there are verses that are allegorical. You know, what is the Arabic word? Mutashabi, or something like that? Yeah, mutashabi. Uh, allegorical, symbolic, likenesses. You know, the Quran says there are both. And it says people who have diseases in their hearts, like sickness in their mind, they go after the part that's allegorical, seeking to find, seeking to impose a final meaning on it. You know, a concrete meaning. While the believers say, it's the truth. It is all, it is all from God. You know? So when I come across a verse like that, I am open to the possibility that it's an allegory. Because the Quran says it uses it, and I'm not going to try to impose some final inter concrete interpretation of it. Are you following me? I'm open to the meanings that it ra raises, but I'm not going to be overly sort of literalistic in approaching verses that talk about something you know, that's very deep, the nature of the human relationship with God, that is outside the normal course of human interaction. You know what I mean? So, you know, 
Some people don't like it, but I'm a, a mathematician, a scientist. I, I gotta approach it that way. <laughs> <laughs>